And it's a, it's a privilege to be with you again this morning. I was glad I could be here uh, the first time I came. Glad I can be with you all again today. I hope that this is an encouragement to you. I hope that this is a blessing to you. And I don't know if you caught a glance of maybe the title of the sermon, Stronghold or, or Sandcastle or Stronghold. Um, but if you did catch a glance of that, you might chuckle a little bit, right? And, and you might think, well, that's kind of, that's kind of silly, right? Um, does that really say sandcastle? And many of us probably haven't built a sandcastle in years. But, you know, you don't have to go to the beach to make a castle of sand. And we are tempted to make sandcastles out of just about anything, to place our trust in things that can crumble, that can die, that can be taken away from us, that can rust, that can be eaten by moths, rather than place our trust in the living God. And as we're going through the message this morning, I just want you to keep that in mind. Are you trusting in a castle of sand? Or are you trusting in the living God? And so please turn in your Bible to Psalm 48. Psalm 48. That's where we'll be this morning. And as you turn there, uh, I just want to start by asking you a question. And I wonder if you've ever placed your confidence in something and found that it's come up short. Maybe you can remember the times when you did go to the beach as a kid and you would build a sand castle, but as the tide rose and the waves came in, it would just wash that castle away and you were disappointed. Or maybe you remember a time when you made an investment, you thought it was a trustworthy stock, but found that instead of gaining a profit, you lost money. What is it that you put your trust in? Maybe you put your trust in a close friend, in a trusted pastor, in your own spouse, only later to have him or her disappoint you. And the tower that you were in, the safe place where you thought would always be safe, that you thought would never disappoint, that you thought would always be a strong refuge for you, it crumbled. And I remember having a friend who visited his old treehouse after a couple years, and he went up to the treehouse, and the wood was so rotted that when he took a step onto the floor, he actually went right through it, not all the way down to the ground, praise God, okay, but he got stuck there, and still he scraped up his whole leg. And that safe place that he thought was safe was no longer safe. And as we walk through this psalm today in Psalm 48, I want you to see that God is always worthy of your enduring trust, that God is always a strong security in times of duress, that he is your never-failing, ever-present stronghold, fortress, refuge, one who can shelter you with his presence, and as Psalm 91 says, cover you with his pinions and under his wings take refuge. And so there are three responses to this psalm as we consider this reality. The first is praise. Praise God as our stronghold, as our strong refuge. And that's in verses 1 to 3. The second is pay attention. Pay attention to God's deliverance. Verses 4 through 8. And the last one is pass on God's legacy of loyal love, verses 9 to 14. And we'll consider the psalm in each of those sections. So I'm not going to read through the whole thing at the beginning. We're going to 
consider each of them segment by segment. So for the first response, praise God as a strong refuge, verses <coughs> 1 to 3. And I'll read from the Legacy Standard Bible. and says, A song, a psalm of the sons of Korah, great is Yahweh and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. God in her palaces has made himself known as a stronghold. And so while at first glance it may appear that Zion is the object of praise, it is really only the avenue to the true object of praise, who is God himself. And that is the nature of these types of psalms. This is classified as a song of Zion. And so these psalms highlight the city as a platform for praising God. And so although your translations, although our translations, right, they may, they may title it something like the city of our God, something like that. But the focus of this psalm is not on the city itself, but on its builder, on its protector, who is God. Psalm 127, verse 1, it says, Unless Yahweh watches the city, unless the Lord watches the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. And so vain are the high towers, the tall walls, the strong ramparts, the citadels, the fortresses, if Yahweh is not watching or guarding the city, there is no true protection. Many of us may be, fam oh, many of us are, are familiar with the Great Wall of China, right? And this wall found in northern China spreads uh, across 13,000 miles at an average height of 25 feet. And it's built to protect from invading armies. And you look at that thing and you're like, all right, who's going to go through that? You want to go first? <laughs> who's going to penetrate that? But someone did. Genghis Khan and some of the Mongol, Mongolian armies. But I think it's interesting. He's not the only one. And there was a Tibetan group of people known as the Tanguts, and the general watching over that portion of the wall, he had a 50-foot trench built alongside the wall. So 50, foot, 50 feet in depth, 50 feet in width, and then he left off watching that part of the wall. And the Tanguts, they noticed that. They noticed that the general just left it off. There's no one patrolling the wall. There's no one watching the wall. So all they did was they filled the trench and they crossed over. And a lesson there, right, is a fortification is only as good as the watchman watching over it. You know, when we think of even a biblical example, you might be familiar with the city of Sardis. It's found in the book of Revelation. It's one of the letters to the seven churches and its geography is amazing. I mean, it's, it's 1,500 feet in elevation. It's surrounded on three sides by smooth mountain cliffs, vertical smooth mountain cliffs. And it was practically unconquerable in its history. But it was conquered, and it was conquered twice, and it was conquered twice in the same way. And how did that happen? The soldiers... They thought it was so inaccessible to get to that part of the city that they just didn't put anybody there to guard it. And so the armies simply scaled the mountainside, caught the city by surprise, and took over. It was said that even if a child was watching, they could have prevented the attack and the city from being conquered. But no one was there. And I wonder what fortresses we've made in our own lives. I mean, we've become really self-sufficient versus God-dependent, haven't we? We can, we can lean that way. And are we putting our trust in our jobs, our homes, 
our education systems, our gated communities, and all those things are, are good, right? But don't let it distract you from where your true trust should be. And where is that? In the one who watches over you? In the one who gave his only son for you? In the one who knows the number of hairs on your head? See, God gives you good things not so that you'll go and make a sand castle out of them to live in, but so that you, you will trust him as the giver of all those good things. And we can easily interchange the two. But we got to be careful of that. As we go to the psalm, I want us to look for a minute at the author. The author is the sons of Korah. And if you remember who Korah was, he was a, a Levite who took along with himself 250 other men to rebel against God and Moses in the wilderness. And so assembling themselves together in their pride and in their rebellion, they were utterly consumed as God opened up the ground underneath them, swallowed them up. And you can read all about that in Numbers chapter 16. But the sons of Korah weren't swallowed up. In fact, Numbers 26, 11 says, the sons of Korah, however, did not die. They weren't consumed. They lived on. And as we go through this psalm, it's clear that they paid special attention to God as a defender of his people and his name, and perhaps even remembering their ancestor Korah's rebellion. And isn't that amazing, right? You may come out of a home filled with particular sins, out of backgrounds of, of particular sins, right? Maybe it's deception, falsehood, and lying. And now you see the alternative so amazing. You see honesty and truthfulness in the Lord and in his word. Maybe it's despair and unkindness. And so what captivates you is God's infinite joy and goodness. Maybe it's control, anxiety, and now you take rest in the sovereignty of God. He's in control of all things. Maybe it's angry outbursts. Maybe it's contention. And so now you see the meekness, you see the easiness, the gentleness of, of Christ. Or something else, right? What is it for you? What kind of background did you come out of? Drunkenness, drugs, sexual immorality, arrogance, fatherlessness. But being brought out of that place, God may now use you to minister to others who are caught there. And that's amazing, isn't it? I mean, God does a complete transformation in the person's life and makes him useful for his purposes. And I think that's what's happening here in this psalm with the sons of Korah. They know, they know of Korah's rebellion and how he stood up against God. That's the background they came out of. And now they pay special attention when God stood up for them as their defender. They see him as the strong defense and refuge. So getting into verse 1, the psalmist, he immediately begins with the covenant name for God, Yahweh, right? Great is Yahweh. Perhaps it says the Lord in some of your Bibles, but his name is Yahweh, and greatly to be praised. And what does that tell us? It pours forth thoughts of his covenant faithfulness, of his love, known only to his people to whom he revealed his name, known only to those who are in a covenant relationship with him those who reside in his city. And so if Yahweh is to be praised anywhere, it would certainly be in his city by his people. In verse 2, it says, Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Mount Zion is used generally to refer to the city of Jerusalem. Jesus even quotes this psalm in Matthew chapter 5, verse 35, where he says, 
Make no oath at all by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And he's quoting this psalm here. And so he substitutes Jerusalem for Mount Zion, and we see that the two are interchangeable. But Zion carries something more. It carries with it the sense of God's protection and God's presence. It draws from the origins of the city itself. See, Zion was a Jebusite fortress on a hill that was captured by David back in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7. You can read about that. And then he called it, <laughs> excuse me, then he called it the city of David. And the Ark of the Covenant was soon brought into that city, symbolizing God's protection, God's presence. And so the word Zion is used to highlight the city as a dwelling place of God. And so Mount Zion, while referring to Jerusalem, also brings us back to its origins when, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought in and God's dwelling was amidst his people in this small city on a hill in its origin. And the mountain upon which this city was built, it was beautiful in elevation, not that it was the highest, but that it was the one chosen by God as his dwelling place. And for this reason, it was the joy of all the earth. Because God dwelt in that city with his people, so this city was full of joy, which just shows us, brothers and sisters, right, that God is, he is not a killjoy. He is the exact opposite. Psalm 1611, right, it says, in his presence is what? Fullness of joy. And my friends, is this not a call for us Christians to be joyful Christians? We who have been bought by Christ's blood, who have the Spirit of God dwelling in us, shouldn't we be a joyful people? These people were joyful because they had God's presence amongst them, and so do we. And in fact, he is with us forever, right? Amen. Praise God. If you are a believer, his spirit indwells you forevermore. He will never forsake you. And then speaking of Mount Zion <coughs> in the far north is a way to say that God's rule extends over the whole world. Even over the nations that do not acknowledge God. See, all nations except Egypt had to approach Jerusalem from the north. Because Jerusalem is locked in by the Judean desert on the east and the Mediterranean Sea on the west. So if you're coming to Jerusalem, you're coming from the north, where all the other pagan nations are coming from. But to say that Mount Zion is in the north is to say that God's sovereign rule extends over all. He truly is King of kings, Lord of lords. And it is particularly noteworthy in this psalm, as we will see, since... Oh, thank you. Thanks, man. Since, uh, since Assyria was in the north, and God brought down their king, demonstrating his reign and power over the whole world, even Assyria in the north would know that Mount Zion was the place where the living God dwelt. And we'll see more of that in a second. Verse 3, it says, God in her palaces, in her citadels, in her large fortified structures has made himself known as a stronghold, literally as a high place, as a place of utmost safety. It's not that he made the city known as a stronghold. It doesn't say that. It says he made himself known as a stronghold. He is the high tower. He is the strong refuge, not the city itself. Proverbs 18.10, it says, the name of Yahweh is a strong tower, and the righteous runs into it and is set securely on high. Proverbs 29.25 says, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in Yahweh is safe, or it's the exact same word, is set securely on high. If you could get to the highest ground, you were thought to be safe from animals, from enemies, 
you were thought to have the upper hand. And so God pictured here as a high tower is one that shows complete safety, one who cannot be overthrown. <coughs> Some of you may be familiar with the missionary John Payton, who went to uh, the land of um, the land of the cannibals, later called by Spurgeon the king of the savages. But one night, they tried to take his life, and so he hid up high in a, in a chestnut tree, and he was out of sight. He was out of harm's way, high up and protected. Well, that's the sense here, right? That for, that for those who run to God, for those who trust in him, he serves as a refuge. He serves as a high tower out of harm's way. And so how has he done this? How has he made himself known as a stronghold? And now we really get to see this on display. So go, go to verses 4 through 8, and I'll read through them. It says, For behold, the kings assembled themselves. They passed by together. They saw it. Then they were astonished. They were dismayed. They fled in alarm. Panic seized them there. Anguish as of a woman in childbirth. With the east wind, you break the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of Yahweh of hosts, in the city of our God. God will establish her forever. Selah. These kings are shaking in their boots. What did they see? Well, think for me for a moment about Israel's air defense system, multi-layered air defense system. It intercepts incoming ballistic missiles and rockets all the way up to 2,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. But the rockets that pose the most immediate threat to the city of Jerusalem are taken out by what's called the Iron Dome. Some of you may be familiar with this. You've maybe seen pictures, right? In October 1st, in October 1st of this year, 200 ballistic missiles were sent from Iran into the nation. And the Israel Defense Force claims that the Iron Dome has a 90% success rate for intercepting incoming missiles. And so while the Iron Dome dealt with most of them, which is incredible, some still penetrated, some still caused damage. And in other words, even the most sophisticated defense system, it can be overwhelmed, just like the Great Wall, just like the city of Sardis. But what happens when God battles for his people who hope in him? How many casualties are there? How many injuries are there? How many arrows shot at the city? Can God be overwhelmed? And I want you to see, with, see this with me if you can. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah. We'll be in here for, for a little while, so I really encourage you to go there. Uh, Isaiah chapter 10. This was almost certainly the backdrop of our psalm. God defending his people against the Assyrian army. Look at verse 5 for a minute. Isaiah 10, <laughs> verse 5. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hands is my indignation. I send it against a godless nation and command it against the people of my Fury. So God is using the nation of Assyria to accomplish his own purposes of punishment toward the city of Jerusalem and his own people. But Assyria didn't think of it that way. Assyria thought it was all powerful, all wise, and was full of pride. Go down to verse 12. It will be that when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the pomp of his eyes which are raised high. For he has said, by the power of my hand and by my wisdom I did this, for I have understanding 
and I removed the boundaries of the peoples and plundered their treasures. And like a mighty man, I brought down their inhabitants. And my hand reached for the wealth of the peoples like a nest. And as one gathers abandoned eggs, I gathered all the earth. And there was not one that flapped its wing or opened its beak or chirped. Is the axe to boast itself over the one who chops with it? Is the saw to magnify itself over the one who wields it? That would be like a rod wielding those who lift it or like a staff lifting him who is not wood. Therefore, the Lord, Yahweh of hosts, will send a wasting disease among his stout warriors. And under his glory, a fire will be kindled like a burning flame. And the light of Israel will become a fire and this holy one a flame, and his holy one a flame, and it will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in a single day. It's talking about the armies of Assyria. One day, and they're done. In fact, verse 19, it says, they're going to be so small that even a child could write down what's left of them. When did that happen? Turn to Isaiah chapter 36. Verse 1, <laughs> now it happened that in the, fifth, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem to King Hezekiah with a heavy military force. Go down to verse 4. Then Rabshakeh said to them, say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria. What is this trust that you have? Go down to verse 13. Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in Judean and said, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Whoa, 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 the great king. I mean, we just read in Psalm 48 that there's one great king, and that great king is Yahweh. Who is this guy? Go to verse 14. Thus says the king of Assyria, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. And do not let Hezekiah make you trust in Yahweh, saying, Yahweh will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. You jump down to verse 18. Beware lest Hezekiah mislead you, saying, Yahweh will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his, his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? So look at all this boasting, all this pride, right? Don't trust in Yahweh. He's going to disappoint you. You won't be delivered. If you go to chapter 37, you see more of that, verse 10. Thus you shall say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, or ha yeah, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, devoting them to destruction. So will you be delivered? What is King Hezekiah's response? Look at verse 15 of chapter 37. And Hezekiah prayed to Yahweh. And man, I want to read all of this, but um, because of time, I'm just going to go to verse 20. But now, O Yahweh, our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are Yahweh, you alone. And look at how Hezekiah is acting behind the scenes, how he encourages his commanders. I just want to read this to you. It's in, it's in 2 Chronicles, so it's another account of this. And this is what he says to his commanders. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be dismayed because of the king of Assyria, nor because of all the multitude that is with him. For the one, for the one with us is greater than the one with him. With him is only an arm of flesh, but with us is Yahweh our God to help us and to fight our battles. 
How's that for leadership in a time of trouble? Dependency on prayer, dependency upon the Lord. And so we enter right into this battle of the great kings, right? Here's the great king of Assyria boasting, thinks it's, it's got the whole earth in its hands, can do whatever it wants, yet Yahweh's the great king. What's going to happen when the two come together? Look at Isaiah 37, verse 33, and this is the last section here. <coughs> well, I'll read. Therefore, thus says Yahweh concerning the king of Assyria, he will not come to this city or shoot an arrow there, and he will not come before it with a shield or throw up a siege ramp against it, by the way that he came, by the same he will return. And he will not come to this city, declares Yahweh. Indeed, I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And then the angel of Yahweh went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And the men arose early in the morning, and behold... All of them were dead bodies. And so Sennacherib, king of Assyria, set out and returned home and lived at Nineveh. And it says, goes on to say that that's where he died. God wins in a landslide. It's not even a competition. Utterly humiliated, the king of Assyria returns and utterly astonished and in fear, he returns back to Assyria, back to Nineveh. Second Chronicles says, Yahweh saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others, and he guided them on every side. Who saved the city? It was Yahweh. How many enemies were there? 185,000. Okay. How many casualties on your end? How many, how many injuries? How many arrows shot at that city? Zero. Zero. And that just emphasizes the reality, right, of God as our strong security. And do you see him as this kind of safe and secure refuge for you in whatever trial you may be facing? Let us pay attention to the details of the deliverance that he has brought us through. And that brings us to that second point. Pay attention to God's deliverance. So if you go back with me to Psalm 48, and looking at verses 4 through 6, right? The kings came, the kings saw, and they didn't conquer. They fled. They ran. Every descriptor in these verses has an element of awe, an element of fear. These men, at least those of them who were left, bore witness to the power of God. And this was the same reaction of the nations who heard of God's deliverance of his people from the hand of Pharaoh in Egypt when he brought them through the Red Sea. It says in Exodus chapter 15, verse 14, the peoples have heard and they tremble. Anguish has seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. The leaders of Moab, trembling, seizes them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. By the greatness of your arm, they are still as stone, frozen with fear. Until your people pass over, O Yahweh, until the people pass over whom you have purchased. Same reaction to God's supernatural power. And so, what did these kings see? I mean, being kings and conquerors, right, it's, it's most likely not the city itself. But how about 185,000 dead bodies of your own men before sunrise? That's what it says, right, back in Isaiah. The angel of Yahweh went out, struck 185,000 men in the camp. And the men arose early in the morning... And the text says, and behold, oh, they saw, right? They saw, behold, all of them were dead bodies. And so this was a manifestation of God's presence, of his protection over his people. 
And to give us a picture of their sudden collapse and of their sudden destruction, the psalmist says in verse 7, with the east wind, you break the ships of Tarshish. These winds could break the strongest and largest trading ships. In fact, that's what the ships of Tarshish were. They were large merchant ships. And these winds could hit hurricane speeds of 60 miles per hour crossing the Mediterranean. It was likely actually the same storm that Paul faced in Acts chapter 27 when he was shipwrecked on the island of Malta. East winds would often be associated with judgment, but also associated with deliverance. So when God pulls back the waves of the Red Sea for his people, right, it's by a strong east wind. And it was an act of judgment against Pharaoh, but an act of, an act of deliverance for his people. And so that's the sense here. God is bringing judgment against these kings, but deliverance to his people. With the east wind, you break, that is, you smash into fragments the ships of Tarshish, right? If, if you guys have ever taken a, a plate or a glass and you have like a cool tile floor and you accidentally drop that plate, what happens to that? Totally shatters, right? If I took a glass and dropped it on these tiles, you totally shatter it. And that's just what happened to these large merchant ships. They would be completely and suddenly dismantled. And that was the case with the Assyrian army that came against Jerusalem. They were utterly destroyed by the judgment of God. And it's even a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 14, verse 25, where it says, Yahweh of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely just as I have intended, so it has happened. And just as I have counseled, so it will stand. To break, it's the same word there, to shatter, Assyria in my land. And I will trod him down on my mountains. And then his yoke will be removed from them and his burden removed from their shoulder. And notice something, right, in verses 4 through 7. There is not one mention of the use of the city's structures for war. And it's not that they didn't prepare. Hezekiah built up the military structures. He made weapons. He made shields. He was ready to fight. He encouraged his army. Yet there's no reference to the people even lifting a finger. The focus is completely on Yahweh as the sovereign protector of his people who hope in him. In verse 8, we see that the people have heard of the faithfulness of God. And now they have seen it for themselves. They have heard of God's deliverance of his people from Egypt as the chariot wheels of, of Pharaoh's army were clogged with mud and wobbling in their pursuit of the Israelites. Not one Israelite dead. Not one Egyptian alive. Psalm 106 verse 11. They have heard of God's deliverance of his people from the Midianites. When God used Gideon and 300 men with trumpets and pitchers to shame and overcome the Midianites. And now they have witnessed the faithfulness of God's protection in their own lives and pause, right? They pause and reflect on it. All the emotions of the kings captured in this one scene, the people did not let this clip pass from their minds. And the stanza, as you notice, the stanza begins with behold. But it ends with Selah. It was given careful thought, given careful rehearsal. And so, my friends, do you look at the past and the providences in your life, how your lot has fallen in your life, and consider God's hand of faithfulness and protection? And brothers and sisters, it is easy for us to forget this. But let us be diligent to remember God's safeguarding of us so we may exalt him as our strong security. <coughs> I mean, I even just think about um, the Thanksgiving service that we were talking about in the announcements, right? What an amazing opportunity to talk about the faithfulness of God and give thanks and praise to him. And as we'll see, it's, it's something we want to pass on, this legacy of love to others. But do you look at the past 
You look at the providences in, in your life. You, you maybe think about how your marriage was on the brink of crumbling and you fell to your knees and God delivered you. How did God answer your prayer? What did he do? Do you remember how you were out of work? You didn't have the money to provide, to provide for yourself, to provide for your family, but God brought you work? How did that happen? Did someone give you a call? Did someone send you a message? I remember uh, a situation. I was, I was one who was out of work, and I needed a job. And um, I, I coach tennis part-time, or that's what I do now. But, and I was a couple years back playing tennis on a tennis court, and I left my hat there. And I had just gone back, you know, I went back to go get my hat, and then there's this tennis coach on the court, and he simply asked me, hey, are you looking for a job? <laughs> I was like, I mean, yeah. So here, here's my contact number, reach out to me if you need anything. And then I started working with him for the next couple of years. Even as I came out here, I was with him for a while. And so it's just amazing to consider, right, God's protection and care for us. And then you have that happen in your own life, right, and you can pass that on to others, and they can be encouraged. Oh, yeah, God is faithful, right? Amen. We read about it, we hear about it, but we've also seen it for ourselves. Young man, young woman, you remember that relationship that maybe didn't work out? And when you look back, you see God's hand of protection, how he's also maturing you to trust in him, that he knows what's best. Believer, do you remember when you were dead in sin and God rescued you out of that dark pit and the means that he used to do it, the books you read, the sermons you heard, the people God put in your life at that particular time? We were just talking about some of those testimonies during the fellowship time. Brothers and sisters, behold, right? Say la. Pause and meditate and carefully consider God's care for you. And if we don't do this, we'll be easily shaken. But if we do, we'll be like the sons of Korah, remembering that God is a strong refuge for us. And in times of trial and times of distress, we remember that God has not changed. He was faithful and powerful to deliver us in the past. He is faithful and powerful to deliver us in the present. He is there as a refuge for us personally to call out to. Psalm 50 verse 15, it says, Call upon me in the day of distress. I shall rescue you and you will glorify me. Psalm 62 verse 8, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. And perhaps you're here and you don't know anything of God's saving grace. You've been brought by a friend. Maybe this is your first time. Or maybe you've been here for a long time. <coughs> and you sit in your seat and you don't have any love for God. You still feel chained to your sins. My friend, can you see the great power of God to save those who hope in him in this psalm? Can you see that even the chains of your sin can be broken, that you can be set free? God is mighty to save. And if your sin does not grieve you, you must know that your sin grieves God. You are created in his image. You are created to reflect his character, but you have spurned him. You have lived for your selfish desires and not for him. Lying, lusting, coveting, hating, loving money, pleasure, and relationships more than God himself. You are a guilty criminal on trial before a holy judge. And for your sin, you deserve nothing but God's judgment to be struck down by God this very moment and cast into eternal punishment, which is what will happen if you hold on to your sins. But there is good news. There is good news for all who let go of their sins and put their trust 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. For it was here just outside the city gates where Jesus, the sinless God-man, was crushed by the judgment of God and on our behalf, who went to the cross as our substitute to bear the full weight of our sin and credit us with his perfect righteousness, you may be counted a child of God. You may be counted a friend of God. You may be saved even today. And that by simply believing in Jesus. As we heard even this morning, right? He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, not his own. The chastening for our peace fell upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. There is no other way to be reconciled to God but through him, right? Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this is the greatest act of protection that God ever accomplished. I mean, even greater than that 185,000 slaughter of men of the Assyrian army. He is shielding his people from his own fury and from his own wrath against sin and pouring it out on his sinless son, Jesus, who died and rose again so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life, as John 3.16 says. And so, my friend, this promise is for you. It's for you if you will receive it. Won't you repent and believe in him? Won't you go from an enemy of God to a child of God? May you say with a songwriter, I was so lost, I should have died. But you, not me, right? You've done it. You've done it, not me. You have brought me to your side. To be led by your staff and rod and to be called a child of God. My friend, I hope you can say in your heart, you can cry out to God and say, Dear Savior, wash me. Wash me in your precious blood. He will do it. He will do it. Why did all of this happen? Why did the Assyrian army fall in a single day? Yeah, you know, we read about it in Isaiah 10. We knew this was a fulfillment of prophecy, but God also makes use of means, right? In Isaiah chapter 37, verse 21, states it clearly. This is what he says. This is what Yahweh says. Because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word that Yahweh has spoken against him. Oh, because you have prayed. Whoa, the power of prayer. Excuse me, sorry. The power of prayer, right? Listen to what Calvin says. Let us remember that a nod alone on the part of God is sufficient to deliver us. And that although our enemies may be ready to fall upon us on every side to overwhelm us, it is in his power whenever he pleases, to strike them with amazement of spirit and thus to make their hearts fail in a moment in the very midst of their efforts against us. Let this reflection serve as a bridle to keep our minds from being drawn away to look in all directions for human aid. Friends, do you believe in the power of prayer? When your heart is weighed down, when you're faced with a difficulty, have you brought your burden to the Lord? Psalm 55, verse 22, it says, Cast your burden upon Yahweh, and he will sustain you. Children, if you're here, do you pray for Jesus to save you from your sins? That is a prayer he loves to hear, a prayer he loves to answer. What is keeping you from that? Married men, do you see the value of prayer that is connected to a thriving relationship with your wife? If you don't live with her in an understanding way, what does the Bible say? Your prayers are hindered. There is a deaf ear to those prayers. And my friend, if you'd have God be your strong security, you better do all you can to make it right 
with your wife. Young man, young woman. <coughs> the Bible says, a prudent wife is from the Lord. And a faithful man who can find. Oh, God can find one. You pray for your spouse. He's not going to give you a stone if you ask him for bread. But if you don't ask him and don't see the need to ask, hey, don't complain if you get a stone. Right? If you get a Jezebel wife, you get a Nabal husband, you didn't ask. Friends, which of you have unbelieving family members or friends? Parents, yeah, do you have wayward children and they grieve your heart? Don't give up on them, right? Pray for their salvation, for their deliverance from darkness and sin. Perhaps God means to work through your prayers to save them, just as he worked through Hezekiah's prayer to save the people. And for anything we face, let us not forget the power of prayer. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And finally, this close attention to God's great deliverance and protection in our lives ought to draw us to pass on God's legacy of loyal love to others. Verse 9, we have thought on your loving kindness, O God, in the midst of your temple. As I mentioned, the first quality which stands out when reflecting on this deliverance is God's covenant-keeping love, his loyal love of which the scripture says in Lamentations 3.22, it never ceases, ever. <coughs> Just for a quick short story, I remember um, on Valentine's Day, my mom would usually send me those edible arrangement fruits. And even as I tell that story and as I think about it, I'm like, wait, Shouldn't it be the other way, right? I should, be, I should be sending her those things. But that's just an expression of her love, right? And if my mom would do that, should we not expect God to be even that much more abundant in his love toward us? It is not a fickle love that fades with time. It is consistent. It is forever. It is loyal. It is purifying. It is, I am with you through thick and thin, I am with you when you walk through that valley of the shadow of death. I am with you, and I will never forsake you. And brothers and sisters, we could meditate upon this even more. Such love of God toward us as we are in covenant relationship with him through Christ's blood, that the promise of Romans 8.28, right? And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That's true. The promise of Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to 32, if God is for us, who's against us? He who indeed did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? That's true. 1 John 3, 1 says, See how great a love the Father has given to us that we would be called children of God, and we are. Amen. And this covenant-keeping love with Israel was known to all the nations at that time. Verse 10, it says, As is your name, O God, <laughs> so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of of righteousness. If you remember Hezekiah's prayer, we only read that one verse right back in Isaiah 37, verse 20. But this is what he said. O Yahweh our God, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are Yahweh, you alone. Well, 2 Chronicles says after this incident, Many were bringing presents to Yahweh at Jerusalem and precious things to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was lifted up in the sight of all nations thereafter. And it's a taste, right? It's a taste of the future kingdom when Christ reigns on the earth. As Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, it says, And many peoples will come, many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the, to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob. 
that he may instruct us from his ways and that we may walk in his paths. And from Zion, the law will go forth and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And because of this, because of his <coughs> righteous judgments and protection, the city of Jerusalem continually rejoices with their whole disposition. The daughters of Judah is another way to say the surrounding cities, the surrounding villages. They continually rejoice. In fact, that word has the sense of circling in joy. And these verbs for rejoicing have an ongoing sense. They are never ceasing in joy because God's demonstration of his covenant love never ceases. And then we are led through the city in a celebratory procession. We are told to consider various aspects of the city, all of them military structures to serve as a testimony to God's strength and protection and presence. Verses 12 to 13, walk about Zion, encircle her, count her towers, take to heart her fortresses, pass between her citadels, see how they are all undamaged, see how they are all untouched, see how no arrow was shot at this city, just as I, Yahweh, have said. Take notice of all that, and why? Verse 13, that you may recount it, right? That you may recount it. God's faithfulness and protection to the next generation. And how does this apply to us? Well, we are to, we are to recount our blessings to the next generation. And remember that you are a vehicle for God's praise. Whatever God has done in your life, whatever deliverance he has taken you through, to proclaim his loyal love, praise is simply the expression of a thankful and happy heart. And so let us praise God who is worthy of our praise. You remember what it was like when you were first saved and your heart was filled with joy from forgiveness of your sins. May we never forget that great deliverance. And let us speak to our children of the greatness of God. Let us speak to the unbelieving generation of the greatness of God so that the generation after us may be able to say, as we have heard from our parents and from our grandparents and from our brothers and from our sisters and from our family and our friends, as we have heard, we have seen it for ourselves. Psalm 89, verse 1, it says, I will sing of the loving kindness of Yahweh forever. From generation to generation, I will make known your faithfulness with my mouth. And so let us bear witness of the greatness of God to those the Lord has put in our lives. You never know what kind of impact that might have. And lastly, verse 14, for this is God, our God, forever and ever. The psalm does not close with praising the city, but praising God. This is God. This is him. He is the sovereign protector. And not only is he the sovereign protector, right? But he is our sovereign protector. He is our God. This God led his people over death. His people were goners, right? I mean, they were toast. But God delivered them from death that day, and they never forgot it. And our God will also lead us over death. For those in Christ, we have an eternal security, a strong refuge of our salvation. John chapter 5, verse 24, it says, Truly, truly, Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who said me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. God rescues us from the authority of darkness, right? Transfers us to the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And we can say with Paul, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Let us rejoice. We have been rescued And so, friends, 
Is your trust in something that's just a sandcastle? Or is it in the solid rock of Jesus Christ? And I think about that song, right? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground, sinking sand. All other ground, sinking sand. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, so much for this wonderful truth, Lord, that you are our stronghold. And we can run to you in time of trouble. Lord, we can put all our hope and trust in you. Lord, I pray for brothers and sisters here as they go through their week, this upcoming week, Lord. May they be reminded where their trust is ultimately. It's in you. And may that give them security. May they find peace and rest. And may any castle of sand that has been building up in the hearts of the men and women here, may that also collapse and come to an end so that they may put their hope and trust where it truly belongs in you, Lord. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.